Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The train leaves in a few minutes. All the seers off, please exit the car. You may wave to your loved ones from the platform. We hope you'll enjoy the trip. Drinks and snacks will be served soon. Get ready to travel through time. Our next stop is a medieval monastery in Modena. Imagine traveling on a train that is actually a time machine that would never bring you back. The 106 passengers and crew of the Zanetti train probably would have thought twice before they embarked on their adventure had they known that. Just like the passengers of the Titanic, which set off for its first and last cruise almost a year later, they never reached their destination. The difference, though, is that no one knows what happened to the train. On July 14, 1911, the rail company Zanetti offered well-off Italians a free trial ride on their new train. The passengers were enjoying their ride, watching scenic views along the way, making small talk, and enjoying their refreshments. One of the sights they were looking forward to was a new tunnel that went through a mountain. It was one of the longest ever built at the time. And that's where the mystery begins. The train entered the half-mile-long tunnel in Lombardy Mountain and never came out, just disappeared. After the incident, the railway workers and police searched every square foot of it, but found no trace of the train. The tunnel itself was just a long tube. There was nowhere to go but to the other side, yet there was neither a train nor any signs of a crash there. However, there were two passengers found who had jumped off the train just before it vanished into the tunnel. Later, when they came to, they were able to tell the story of their eerie trip. As the train approached the tunnel, black smoke came out of nowhere as well as a dense white fog. The train slowed down as it was nearing the entrance, and the fog began to envelop it. The men panicked and jumped to the ground before the train was gone. One of the survivors told an Italian newspaper about the incident. I heard an unclear humming sound. Beyond the black smoke, I could see a milky white fog creeping from the tunnel. It literally swallowed the train like a wave. And with it, the first car of our ill-fated train split open. It became so horrifying, the train was barely moving, so I jumped from the car and my eyes caught another passenger who jumped at the same time. We both hit the ground hard, and that is the last thing I remember. The injured men suffered from sleeping troubles and other stress disorders for a while. As for the train, it was never seen again. Word spread about the tunnel, and officials thought it was best to close it. Then, the notorious tunnel happened to get bombed during World War II, closing it off forever. No one could come up with a sound explanation for this strange disappearance. Dozens had witnessed the train leaving the station in Rome and entering the tunnel, but nobody saw it come out. But that's not the last time we'd hear about the mysterious train. There are records of medieval monks from Medina who saw a three-car train with people in it. How could they conceive a huge iron machine puffing clouds of black smoke? A horse was the fastest means of transport at the time. Railroads hadn't been invented yet. Well, they thought it, along with the passengers who they described, were clean-shaven and dressed in black all must be the work of some evil forces. You can say that medieval monks made it up. But here's the thing. Their report was kept in the records of Castasolia, stored by the Sagino family. And one of the survivors of the train had the name Sagino. Then, in the 1840s, there's a report that the Zanetti passengers were seen in Mexico. A psychiatrist in a local hospital left notes saying that a group of 104 Italians were all admitted in a hysterical state. They were all dressed in strange clothes, obviously from a different place, and claimed they were traveling from Rome by a Zanetti train. One of the passengers actually had a cigarette box with a future date of 1907 on it. They say it is still kept in a Mexican museum. The psychiatrist concluded that it was a case of mass insanity, but he failed to come up with any explanation for it. There are no records left of the patients after that. Many years later, the train appeared again in Europe. On October 29, 1955, 
A three-car, old-fashioned train appeared not far from Zavalichi, a small village in Ukraine. The signalman, Pyotr Yustomenko, saw it moving soundlessly. He reported that he had been on duty that night and suddenly saw a train that wasn't on the schedule. The train was heading without tracks to Gasford Mountain. He thought he was seeing things and rubbed his eyes, but there it was, with shut curtains, open doors, and an empty driver's cabin. Ustomenko had never seen a train like that before, but he knew it was old, definitely a pre-war model. The description he gave was the same as that of the Zanetti. It's unlikely a signalman from a remote town in the USSR would know anything about an Italian train lost at the beginning of the 20th century. Another interesting note about this sighting is that at the end of the 19th century, there was an Italian cemetery built on Gasford Mountain near Sevastopol. About 2,000 Italian soldiers who died during the Crimean War were buried there. Later, a railroad from Balaclava was constructed over the former cemetery, but then was destroyed after the Revolution of 1917 because it was no longer used. Was the ghost train riding on ghost tracks to meet its Italian brethren? I guess we'll never know. And again, this wasn't the last account of the train appearing. As crazy as all this sounds, could there be a scientific explanation of the ghost train adventures? Some believe all the railroads in the world form a sort of connected web that has its own magnetic field. The trains serve as electric conductors between the Earth's natural magnetic field and the artificial one. The conflict between the two forces creates fractures in time with endless holes. This explanation is based on Einstein's theory of relativity and Minkowski's definition of distance. These fractures are called chronal holes. Sometime before the Zanetti train left the station, there had been an earthquake where the tracks were. It's believed the crust fracture, which appeared under Lombardi Mountain, created a time anomaly at the entrance to the tunnel. The train became the link necessary to dig through time and space and it fell from its time vector where it belonged and could move to other times. So, in layman's terms, it was traveling through time. In case you're already getting goosebumps and swearing off trains forever, rest assured that this isn't something you have to worry about happening to you, because it's just an urban legend. It got so popular that some paranormal enthusiasts devoted years to finding proof of the Zanetti train's existence. As time went on, more names and details were added to the legend. However, if you try to look up the rail company Zanetti, Castasolia, the Zangino family, or a signalman named Pyotr Ustamenko, you'll only find links to different versions of this legend. Ghosts and trains make for great stories, but there has yet to be any evidence of a ghost train ever existing. But I don't think that'll stop people from looking for them or telling more stories about them. If you have the time, you can find dozens of stories about ghost trains to keep you entertained. One of the most popular stories is a play written by Arnold Ripley in 1923, The Ghost Train, that was inspired by a creepy night he spent at a remote railway station. The voyage started just like any other. The cargo ship SS Cotopaxi is making another journey to Havana, Cuba to deliver coal. It's November 29, 1925. For Captain Meyer and his crew, leaving Charleston Port, South Carolina, it will be the last trip the ship ever makes. Its route ran through the Bermuda Triangle. Two days into the trip, the Cotopaxi sent out a distress signal. It had got caught up in a strong tropical storm and turned over on its side. The wind was very strong and there was powerful lightning as well. Rain gradually filled the ship's hold. Then there was a bright white flash, and the ship disappeared without a trace. Later, its wreckage was found in the Gobi Desert, which is in a completely different part of the world. All 32 crew members, including the captain, were missing. Of course, the part about the Gobi Desert is fictional. For one of his movies, Steven Spielberg came up with the idea that the ship was moved there by aliens. Still, in real life, the ship was never found, and its crew really did disappear. 
it was officially declared missing a month afterward, and nobody could find the wreck. It seems like a classic case of mysterious things going on in the Bermuda Triangle. But most mysteries are solved sooner or later. In 2020, the Cotopaxi was found. A man named Michael Barnett had moved to Florida to study shipwrecks off the coast. One wreck in particular really caught his attention. It was much larger than the others, and the locals called it the Bear Wreck. It was about 40 miles from St. Augustine in northern Florida. But no one had ever managed to identify the rusty hull. So Michael started to do some detective work. He measured the size of the shipwreck and started working through all the information he could find. He researched hundreds of old newspapers, leafed through insurance records, and looked at artifacts found on the wreck. After hundreds of hours of hard work, Michael was sure it was the Cotopaxi. But a few years before, there had been a rumor that the same ship had been found off the coast of Cuba. The Coast Guard found the wreck of a cargo ship about the same size that looked a lot like the one lost in 1925. Michael was sure they were wrong, so he teamed up with some science journalists and kept investigating. Soon, they discovered something that seemed to confirm Michael's belief. Divers found brass valves with the letters SV on them in the wreckage of the ship. Michael suggested these initials referred to Scott Valve Manufacturing Company. The headquarters of this company was in Michigan, not far from where the Cotopaxi had been built. The company had probably supplied parts for the Cotopaxi. So the puzzle seemed to be solved. The bear wreck was really the missing cargo ship. But Michael still needed to work out why the ship had sunk. Did something mysterious really happen to the Cotopaxi in the Bermuda Triangle? Later, Michael found the testimony of the ship's carpenter among some old papers. The carpenter claimed that the hatches covering the coal on the ship had been in a terrible condition before it sank. Repair work on the covers wasn't finished before the crew got the order to sail to Cuba. So if the hatch covers were still broken during the trip, water could have easily gotten on board. This water probably flooded the hole during the tropical storm. This was the real reason why the Cotopaxi went down. There was really nothing mysterious about it. It was just a mistake made by ordinary people. But this is just one example out of dozens, or even hundreds, where ships and planes have gone missing in the Bermuda Triangle. We still can't explain some of these incidents. It seems like there really is something weird going on there. One of these strange events happened in 1948. A passenger jet was headed for Miami from San Juan, Puerto Rico. It disappeared in the same area as the Cotopaxi. The 32 people on board vanished without a trace. The weather was clear throughout the flight, but experts think that when the plane was about 50 miles from the coast, it could have been hit by a strong wind that knocked it off course. Years later, a similar plane was found in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. But because no one could work out the registration, it was impossible to say for sure if it was the same one. Something even stranger occurred not long before, in 1945. Five planes went missing all at the same time. Some trainee pilots were practicing their navigation skills. But when they'd finished, it seems they couldn't find their way back home and disappeared. Many people assume they just ran out of fuel. This seems likely, but still, the circumstances were really strange. The trainees were being supervised by an experienced pilot who had 2,500 hours of flight time. He would never have let a group of newbie pilots get that far away from their base. Even now, people still debate what could have happened. Some insist the pilots ran into something supernatural out there in the Bermuda Triangle. But who knows? And here's another freaky thing that happened there which no expert has been able to explain. Time travel. In 1970, Bruce Gernon was flying a plane from Andros Island to the Florida coast. When he was at 11,500 feet, a giant cloud appeared in front of him. It kept getting bigger and bigger, and he had no choice but to fly through it. As soon as he did, the plane was surrounded by darkness. It was as if the day had turned to night in a split second. 
Suddenly, Bruce began to see white flashes of light around him. They were so bright that they lit up the entire sky. But they weren't lightning bolts, although he couldn't really explain what they were. The plane continued through the strange cloud for almost a half an hour. Bruce noticed that the cloud changed shape during this time. The space around the plane turned into a tunnel. Then the tunnel started narrowing. Bruce became really tense as he tried to cope with the plane's controls. All his instruments and navigation equipment were going crazy, and the electronics stopped working. Then, a white light appeared at the end of the tunnel. Just like in the movies, the plane escaped the closing cloud tunnel at the very last second. Everything was fine, but now Bruce found himself in some white fog. He had no idea where he was. Then, he managed to contact ground control. He was shocked when he learned that his plane was already in the airspace above Miami. It seemed that something impossible had happened. Bruce was meant to cover a distance of about 250 miles during the flight. This usually took one and a half hours, but he had managed it in just 47 minutes, almost two times faster than normal. When Bruce landed, he went to check the amount of fuel left in the tank. It turned out he'd used up a lot less than the normal amount of fuel as well. Could there be a logical explanation for the time-traveling plane? Well, records show that a large number of sunspots were detected on the surface of the sun that day. And there was a strong solar wind. This could easily have made the electronics and devices on the plane go crazy. But what about the mysterious cloud? The Florida coast is a place where two large air currents meet. One has a high pressure, and the other is a low pressure one. This causes a lot of storm clouds in the area. But people still debate how Bruce was able to cover the distance so quickly. Some people say that some kind of mysterious dark energy was involved. Others say it was a gravitational anomaly that curves space and time. Others think that Bruce is just a fraud. We still don't know the truth. So, is there really something supernatural about the Bermuda Triangle? Or is it all just coincidences and made-up stories? The truth is that no more planes and ships disappear in the Bermuda Triangle than anywhere else in the world. The airplane involved was a Beechcraft Bonanza single-engine aircraft. On board, pilot Bruce Gurnon had two passengers, his father and business partner. They took off from Andros Island in the Bahamas and headed northwest for the Florida coast. It was December 4, 1970. If you draw up a map, trace a line connecting the island of Bermuda, Puerto Rico, Miami, and back to Bermuda, what do you get? Yes, it's a triangle, a sinister polygon known for mysteriously swallowing over 2,000 ships and 200 aircraft over the centuries. Bruce Gurnon's plane was within its hungry grasp. But this was a typical flight Bruce had made dozens of times before. The trip usually took about an hour and a half, with no hiccups or mysterious phenomena whatsoever. The men were no more concerned than you would be during your daily commute to work. Oh, but this time would be different. They would face very unusual circumstances indeed. Bruce took off and started gaining altitude. Strange things started happening right from the get-go. At an altitude of about a thousand feet, he noticed a small cloud up ahead. But it kept growing. Not from the plane getting closer, this thing was actually getting bigger in size. Bruce had to fly through it, and he came out the other end just fine. Another mysterious cloud appeared at 11,500 feet. This one was massive, and Bruce had no other choice but to fly through it too. So he concentrated, took a deep breath, and in they went. At that moment, it got dark as night all around the aircraft. Not a single sliver of sunshine got through. But this wasn't a storm cloud, and it wasn't raining. Bruce was starting to get worried, and then, bam, he saw flashes of white light. They would appear and vanish quickly like lightning. But this pilot knew this certainly was no lightning. The flashes were so bright, they lit up the whole space around them. Bruce kept flying for another 30 minutes when he realized this was the same cloud he had gone through earlier when he started to climb. But now the cloud was cylindrical and the plane was flying through its center. 
It was about one mile wide and seemed endless. Bruce thought he could never get out of that trap. But a minute later, he saw light at the end of the tunnel. He kept that yoke straight ahead. He was almost out of this nightmare. But all of a sudden, unexplainable things started happening again. The walls of the cloud tunnel began to narrow. They were closing in on the plane. The navigational instruments started wigging out. The compass was spinning by itself counterclockwise. The electronic instruments were all malfunctioning. It was like the plane was being operated by something else. Or it was moving inside some kind of current. All of Bruce's attempts to take control were to no avail. He kept flying through that tunnel, bound and determined to get out of this thing and live to tell the tale. The walls kept narrowing, smaller and smaller, wrapping like a vortex. Bruce was running out of time. He had to get out of this place fast. The next 20 seconds were the most intense of his life. But then, he burst out of this foggy trap. As Bruce described later, he felt weightless for 5 seconds as his plane left the tunnel. The clouds dispersed, and now the aircraft was in a grayish haze. The men let out a big sigh of relief. He immediately grabbed the radio and contacted ground control. Bruce wanted them to determine his location. But when the dispatcher looked at the green screen, his face became contorted with confusion. Bruce's plane wasn't on the radar. It was as if the thing was invisible. But then the dispatcher said the aircraft was already in Miami airspace. Bruce was utterly shocked by this information. It just couldn't be true. The distance the beach craft was supposed to cover was about 250 miles. Remember, the whole trip usually took around 90 minutes. But this time, it took just 47 minutes to get to the destination. This model of aircraft can only cruise at about 180 miles per hour. Do the math, and anyone would understand that this was physically impossible. The dispatcher must have made a mistake. But when the clouds parted, Bruce saw that he really was over Miami. The plane landed safely, and it was time to try and solve this mystery. So what happened on that flight? Bruce checked the remaining fuel and his watch. After a short calculation, he was only more confused. The plane hadn't gone through the amount of fuel it should have. Bruce couldn't have been wrong. He was a very experienced pilot. By his early 20s, he already had 600 hours of flight under his belt. And he was all too familiar with this airspace he'd flown countless times. All the evidence in hand seemed to indicate that Bruce's plane just skipped over almost half the entire distance. The man thought about this bizarre occurrence for a long time. He even consulted with professors and experts. But none of them could give an exact answer to what happened that day. So he came up with his own theory and even wrote a book about it. Bruce thought it all came down to this electric fog with white flashes. Others, however, theorized that dark energy was responsible for this time leap. Yes, that same dark energy responsible for the expansion of the universe. This energy could have curved time-space like a black hole, forming this strange tunnel. Bruce accidentally hit it, but he was lucky to get out of there. That's how he got into Miami airspace so fast. But dark energy is just a theory attempting to explain the unexplainable. To this day, there is no real answer for how Bruce was able to travel that distance in such a short time. But some details still can be explained. Archive records show that 84 sunspots were recorded that day, as well as a huge solar wind moving almost 440 miles per second. This would cause disturbances in the Earth's magnetosphere that could throw off the plane's instruments and radars. So Bruce's version that he was in an electronic fog could be right. And about these weird clouds. The thing is, they're pretty commonplace things in this area. Zones with low and high pressure are constantly colliding there. The result? Storm clouds. Perhaps that cloud growing before Bruce's eyes was simply two massive air currents crashing into each other. But so far, no one has been able to explain how the plane got to Miami so fast. Well, maybe in the future the truth will be revealed. In the meantime, it remains another mysterious riddle of the Bermuda Triangle.
but it's still by far not the most shocking incident there. In 1945, a total of five planes went missing in the Bermuda Triangle all at once. On December 5th, some Navy student pilots were training in the area. The day's lesson? Navigation. Ironically enough, they couldn't find their way back to the base and got lost. Many people assume they ran out of fuel. This is likely to have caused the incident, but the circumstances were very strange. The students were under the supervision of an experienced lieutenant who had 2,500 flight hours. He would never let a bunch of newbies go so far that they'd get lost. The incident was called Flight 19. Even now, there's a debate about how it could have happened. Three years later, a passenger jet headed to Miami from Puerto Rico disappeared in the same area. There were 29 passengers and three crew members on board. The weather was clear throughout the flight. But experts believe that when the plane was about 50 miles off the coast of Miami, it could have been hit by a strong wind that knocked it off course. Years later, divers found a similar-looking plane in the waters. But since it was lacking certain details and registrations, no one could confirm that it was the missing Miami-bound aircraft. The next month, in January 1948, another plane went missing in Bermuda. 25 passengers and 6 crew members just vanished somewhere between Azores and Bermuda. The mystery of this plane's disappearance, along with countless others, remains unsolved. The moon shines brightly and illuminates the black water of the ocean. Thick fog descends on it in ominous silence. Then, it's suddenly broken by the creaking of wooden boards, followed by a rippling of the waves. Through the fog, you see the outline of an old, large ship. Its hull is rusty, and a strange cold is coming from it. But the most unsettling thing is that there's no one on the deck. The ship sails without a crew. No, this isn't a mythical Flying Dutchman, but a very real ghost ship. September 2nd, 2019. The British Royal Navy's ice patrol ship, called the HMS Protector, sails through the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The time is 11 p.m. Some of the ship's crew are on deck, while others are sleeping in their cabins. The captain steers the ship and looks straight at the horizon. The sky is lit up by an orange twilight, and clouds float in the distance. Suddenly, against this beautiful landscape, one of the sailors notices the black silhouette of an unknown ship. The captain slows down and steers the ship a little closer to the mysterious vessel. This is an old cargo ship, 250 feet long. Attempts to contact the crew members lead to nothing. It seems the unknown boat is floating in the ocean by itself. There's no one on board, at least no one alive. The deck of the ship creaks from rocking on the waves. The sun sinks below the horizon and it gets dark. The ship looks terrifying. British sailors don't dare to climb on that strange deck. They take a photo, post it on the internet, and sail away. Many people on the internet will assume the sailors met a real ghost ship. Five months later, we're in the village of Ballycotton in County Cork, Ireland. A local leaves the house early in the morning to go for a daily run. Music in his headphones, fresh cool air, and a scenic route are ideal conditions for a good workout. The jogger runs along the road on the coast of the Celtic Sea. There was a strong storm last night, and now the sea looks calm. The man runs along the top of a low cliff and notices a huge vessel. An old rusty cargo ship 250 feet long lies on the beach right among the rocks. No people on board. It seems the ship has been here for ages, but the local is sure this vessel wasn't here yesterday. A little later, it turns out this is the same ship that the sailors from the HMS Protector saw five months ago, thousands of miles from this place. The cargo ship, called the Alta, was built in 1976. Nobody knows who used it all this time and for what purposes. It's only known that in 2017, the ship was purchased by a new owner and marked with the flag of Tanzania. 
It's important to say that almost all cargo ships are equipped with AIS, Automatic Identification System, which is needed to track ship movements in the ocean. Since 2015, something strange started happening with the Alta's AIS. The ship disappeared from the satellites, then reappeared again. Over the past few years, this ship had changed several names and flags. It's not surprising that its AIS shut off and turned on numerous times. It's said that some of those who disable AIS on their ships do so to hide outlaw activities. The ship's captain, whoever it was, clearly didn't want to show the Alta's movements. As AIS showed in 2017, the ship had sailed near Greek port cities. The Alta made 12 stops in three such cities in different parts of Greece. Then, the AIS signal disappeared. And 10 months later, the Alta reappeared near the northern coast of Africa, 1,200 miles from Greece. In September of 2018, the ship was sailing about 1,400 miles southeast of Bermuda. And at that time, the crew members started having problems. There were 10 people on board the Alta. On September 19th, the ship's engine failed right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The nearest shore was very far away. The ship began to drift. As days passed, the crew couldn't fix the vessel. Food supplies were running low. The crew started to panic and tried to contact someone. The situation got worse as a strong hurricane was approaching the place where the ship broke down. Crew members contacted the U.S. Coast Guard. On October 2nd, a helicopter headed towards the ship. Food and water were unloaded on the Alta. This was enough for the crew to bide their time for several days. About a week later, a rescue boat sailed about 1,500 miles to reach the Alta and help the stranded sailors. Shortly before the start of the hurricane, American rescuers succeeded. The entire crew of the wrecked ship was taken to Puerto Rico. The Alta remained drifting in the ocean. After a while, another ship arrived to tow it to the coast of Guiana. Then, something went wrong again. The ship was hijacked. Who did it and why remains a mystery to this day. But then, for some unknown reason, the thieves decided to abandon the ship and left it to drift in the ocean. For almost a year, the ship's location couldn't be tracked. Then, in September 2019, the vessel was found by the British Royal Navy. How the Alta was able to cover the distance across the Atlantic and wash up on the coast of Ireland is unknown. An investigation has been launched in Ireland. It's necessary to identify the owner of the vessel and find a responsible person to take on the task of towing it. But no one has since been found. Once, an unknown person called the Irish authorities and introduced themselves as the owner of the ship, but didn't provide any evidence. Several barrels of oil were found on board the Alta. To dismantle the ship, the Irish authorities will need to spend about 10 million euros. Local residents are annoyed by the wreck too. Corroding metal is bad for the environment, and kids have already snuck on board and posted a video on the internet from inside the abandoned ship. The further fate of the Alta remains unresolved. It's still lying there. That ship sailed in the ocean for just two years. Now imagine if some other managed to drift for 38. In all that time, no one could catch this ship, and people still seek it. That vessel is called the SS Bechimo. It was a merchant ship owned by a Canadian trading company. In 1931, the ship got stuck in ice off the coast of Alaska. A strong snowstorm began. The team waited a week for it to end, but the storm only intensified. One day, the weather improved a bit, and part of the team was evacuated to the nearest city. Another part of the crew with the captain set up camp near the ship. The storm started again and didn't stop for a long time. The blizzard was so heavy that the ship's captain couldn't see beyond his arm's reach. Finally, when the storm was over, the captain saw that the ship simply vanished. He decided the Bechimo sank during the storm. A week later, the ship was found, drifting near the place where it was lost. The hull of the ship was damaged so badly that it was unsafe to sail on it. The captain decided to abandon the ship. 
However, it didn't sink. For the next 38 years, it was drifting at various points along the Alaskan coast. Several times, people climbed on the ship, including native Alaskan residents and a group of researchers. Attempts to save the vessel from the sea ended in failure. The salvage operations were hampered by drifting ice and bad weather. The last time it was seen was in 1969. The ship was frozen and blocked by the ice. In 2006, the government created a special project to find the Bechimo. However, in all these years, the ship still hasn't been found. Its fate is unknown. It's likely that the ship has finally found peace and is now lying on the seabed of the Chukchi Sea.